Back in 1999, Marshall Mathers, professionally known as Eminem, went from a respected battle rapper trying to survive his low-income circumstances in Detroit to a bleached blonde international superstar with his very first major label album, The Slim Shady LP. Handpicked by Dr. Dre and signed to the founding member of NWA's record label Aftermath Entertainment, Eminem became the first soloist to release an album with the California-based company after Dre stepped away from his previous company, Death Row Records. With his vast vocabulary, dense wordplay, and endless shock value, Eminem's music videos had a home on MTV day and night, with mainstream media rolling out the red carpet for him. He wasn't afraid to talk trash about the pop stars that he was sharing magazine space with, or talk about drugs and violence to the point that he had many conservative groups coming for his head. Eminem's first album had graphic songs written from the point of view of his wild and reckless alter ego Slim Shady. Once Eminem switches on his Slim Shady style, you're liable to start hearing songs about drug abuse and Eminem killing his own mother and his daughter's mother, causing him to face censorship threats from Congress, the Federal Communications Commission, religious groups, and radio stations. Eminem's ability to stir up controversy and point out the hypocrisy in society didn't stop his career from exploding. In fact, Eminem managed to sell over 3 million copies of the Slim Shady in the United States. This number went up to a total of 4 million the following year in 2000. And then it ended up selling over 5 million copies with his next two albums, The Marshall Mathers LP and The Eminem Show, both doing double that and both gaining rare diamond-selling album plaques. With the ability for Eminem's music to pull an immeasurable amount of money out of the clear blue sky, Dr. Dre had hit the jackpot, and soon Eminem would look to do the same with his own record label, Shady Records. Established in 1999, the same year Eminem dropped his first project for Aftermath Entertainment, Shady Records was founded by Eminem and his manager Paul Rosenberg after the incredible success of the Slim Shady LP. Backed by three other massive music industry machines, Dr. Dre's Aftermath Entertainment, which is distributed by Jimmy Iovine's Interscope Records, underneath the parent company of Universal Music Group. Shady Records has had many significant highlights, such as being a crucial part of the successful worldwide anger management tours between 2002 to 2005 that not only featured shady acts like Eminem, 50 Cent, G-Unit, D12, Stat Quo, and Obi Trice, but also brought along other hip-hop giants like Dr. Dre, Busta Rhymes, Missy Elliott, DMX, Mob Deep, Ice Cube, Cypress Hill, Snoop Dogg, and Ludacris, along with rock stars like Papa Roach, Limp Bizkit, Korn, Rob Zombie, Linkin Park, and even Marilyn Manson. Shady Records was also the label behind the four times platinum-selling soundtrack to the movie 8 Mile, starring Eminem, which was based on his life growing up in Detroit, fighting his way into the music industry. The track listing for 8 Mile not only highlighted Shady Records' artists, but it also had songs from Rakim, Nas, Gangstar, Jay-Z, AC Gray, Exhibit, and Young Z. There's never been a shortage of talent on Shady Records, with a roster that included Eminem himself, Bad Meets Evil, Eminem's duo with Royce to 5 9 Slaughterhouse, Royce the Five Nines group with Joe Budden, Crooked Eye, and Joel Ortiz, 50 Cent, D12, Yellow Wolf, West Side Gun, and Conway the Machine, along with their Griselda group with Benny the Butcher, Obi Trice, Stat Quo, DJ Green Lantern, and many more. Eminem's second and third albums, the Slim Shady LP and the Marshall Mathers LP, both came out directly through Aftermath Entertainment and Interscope Records. But ever since the 12 million selling album The Eminem Show in 2002, every Eminem record has also been under Eminem's own Shady Records imprint, with his partner Paul Rosenberg. As of Eminem's 2020 project Music To Be Murdered By, he has never had an album sink below selling 1 million units or more. So Eminem's musical output on Shady Records has obviously been a massive plus to the company's growth. But after Shady Records has released over a dozen albums that have grabbed the platinum plaque or better, the once memorable label has been predominantly known as the home of Eminem as of late, without a single high-selling album from his other artists since 2015. Now West Side Boogie, Grip, and Bad Meets Evil seem to be the only current shady acts other than Eminem, which begs the question, how has a powerhouse like Shady Records taken such a dive in recent years? Paul Rosenberg with Eminem formed his label Shady Records the same year he launched his debut album, but didn't build the business alone. How did he meet his partner, Paul Rosenberg, whom he trusted enough to be his manager and the co-founder of the company? Well, it's because the two from Detroit met back in 96, as Rosenberg explained. When I was in law school in Detroit, I used to go to this place called The Hip Hop Shop, which was on Seven Mile Road. It was a clothing store that turned into an open mic, freestyle battle place on Saturdays. 
One day, Eminem's close friend, the late Detroit rapper Proof, pulled me aside and said, Hey, I want you to stay after open mic today so you can check out my man. Proof wanted me to check him out because he knew that my goal in law school was to become a music lawyer. And he looked at me as somebody who might be able to help artists in the local community be able to make connections after I had graduated and started a career. So I stayed, and he cleared everybody out, and in comes this guy. Paul Rosenberg was the son of a Detroit area attorney and was able to mix that career path with hip hop, the music that he grew up infatuated with. Rosenberg had even pushed for his own rap career on the Detroit scene before getting his law degree, but the pursuit of the creative side of the business was short-lived. It was actually artist management that seemed more fascinating to Rosenberg than drafting legal contracts, so he began learning about the music industry from the inside by interning at record labels. These efforts led Paul Rosenberg to meet Eminem in 96, when M was at a low point where he was losing confidence in his dream to be a rapper, three years before they started Shady Records together. The two stayed in touch after meeting each other, and when Rosenberg relocated to New York City. Later on, Paul Rosenberg pitched the idea of becoming Eminem's manager to him, and the partnership began after Rosenberg handed off legal duties to his mentor, veteran barrister Theo Settlemar, who has since been an entertainment lawyer for both Eminem and 50 Cent. Using Def Jam as an inspiration for Shady Records, Eminem and Paul struck a deal with Jimmy Iovine's Interscope and Dre's Aftermath, the same two companies that previously released Eminem's debut album. When Shady Records started in 1999, it all began with Eminem, who was already signed to Aftermath looking for a way to get his group of close friends known as D12 or Dirty Dozen to get a record deal. This led to Eminem's manager Paul Rosenberg pushing for the two to start their own imprint instead of looking for a D12 deal elsewhere. Not only was D12 the first act signed to Shady Records, but they pulled in the company's first platinum album in 2001. This debut from D12 was called Devil's Night, which would end up going double platinum. The album titled Devil's Night stems from a dangerous Detroit tradition of properties getting sound fire on Halloween. Among its worst cases was in 1984, when these Devil's Night's events exploded into 810 fires reported as pre-Halloween arsons in the city. Devil's Night the album benefited from Eminem's star power as a way of introducing the other group members. Proof, Bizarre, Denon Porter, Caniva, and Swifty McVeigh. There were other members that came and went before the album was made. Bugs was one such member who unfortunately was murdered in a drive-by shooting after he stepped up in defense of his friend's cousin. The album Devil's Night was loaded with shock value subject matter such as pill pop and drug abuse, you know, over the top, women, comments, and descriptions of ultraviolence to the point that a censored version of the album was also released. There were song titles from the explicit version that were even renamed, such as Purple Pills Becoming Purple Hills and Fight Music Becoming Flight Music. The psychotic frat party anthems were amplified by production from Dre and Eminem, but critics of that era generally didn't seem to have the stomach for the depictions of lawlessness that bordered on sounding like a subgenre of horrorcore. This wouldn't stop Devil's Knife from peaking at number one on the Billboard 200 chart, though. D12 had continued success showing up on Shady Records projects like Eminem's The Eminem Show, The 8 Mile Soundtrack, and Obi Trice's Cheers. But outside animosity was starting to interrupt the D12 success train, including beef with a friend turned foe in the form of fellow Detroit rapper Royce the 5 9 after he and D12 had a severe misunderstanding. The drama apparently began when a Royce freestyle contained the lyrics, F anger management, I need to hire somebody to manage my anger. Being that D12 was on the anger management tour, they took Royce's lyrics personally. The conflict between Royce the 5 9 and D12 heated up, and Royce, who was widely considered the better lyricist, started letting off harsh diss tracks like S On You, which used the beat to D12 song by the same name, and another verbal attack called Malcolm X. Being that Eminem was friends with D12 and Royce, it put M in the middle of a beef that he didn't seem to take any sides on. Ultimately, the tension escalated to the point of Royce and D12 member Proof pulling guns out on each other, both getting arrested and then settling their issues from adjoining jail cells. D12 World was the name of the group's second album, which came out in 2004. Along with Eminem producing the majority of the project, there were also several recognizable producers involved, like Dr. Dre, Kanye West, High Tech, Mr. Porter, and Red Spider. D12 World was able to match the success of their first album going double platinum once again, along with two gold singles, My Band and How Come. But unfortunately, this would be the group's last album, with Eminem focusing more on his own solo career. Another major blow that pushed D12 closer to dissolving as a group happened one night when a gruesome situation at the CCC Club on 8 Mile Road in Detroit took place that put a dark cloud over D12's ongoing success. On April 11, 2006, the D12 member Proof, 
also one of the closest people to Eminem in Detroit's hip-hop scene, was playing a game of pool with a man named Keith Bender. The two men became engaged in an argument that got out of hand, leading to a physical conflict. Keith Bender's cousin, Mario Etheridge, soon got involved and attempted to break up the fight by pulling out a gun and firing a warning shot into the air. But among the various conflicting reports that came up in the news, proof reportedly shot Keith Bender in the head during their conflict, which led to Bender dying a week later. This action led to Mario Etheridge shooting Proof once in the head and twice in the chest, killing him right then and there. Several weeks after both Proof and Keith Bender died, Bender's family started a wrongful death suit against Proof's estate. It was determined by the authorities that Mario Etheridge was acting lawfully in defense of another, but that didn't prevent him from being found guilty of carrying a concealed weapon, as well as discharging a firearm inside a building. Proof's lawyer would oppose the police reports that they felt wrongly stated that Proof was shot first in the shooting incident at Detroit's CCC Club. Eight days after this incident took place, that took Proof's life, there was a funeral service held for him on April 19, 2006 at the Fellowship Chapel in Detroit. The funeral was packed with 2,660 people, including lifelong friends Eminem, Royce the 59 50 Cent, and thousands of people paying their respects to Proof from outside the venue before Proof was buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. The massive loss affected Eminem deeply, and after two days of mourning privately, Eminem spoke publicly about what it was like to lose Proof, a man he considered to be his best friend. You don't know where to begin when you lose somebody who's been such a big part of your life for so long. Proof and I were brothers. He pushed me to become who I am. Without Proof's guidance and encouragement, there would have been a Marshall Mathers, but probably not an Eminem and certainly never a Slim Shady. Not a day will go by without a spirit and influence around us all. He will be missed as a friend, father, and both the heart and ambassador of Detroit hip-hop. Proof was considered the glue that kept the members of D12 together. Therefore, after his death, the group found it difficult to keep going together as a unit. Aside from periodic D12 songs and shows with only a portion of the members involved, the shaky status of D12 was clarified on August 31, 2018, when Eminem released his 10th studio album, Kamikaze. In the song Stepping Stone, Eminem made it known that D12 had officially disbanded. Obi Trice was introduced to Eminem through D12's Bazaar, and Obi became the second Shady Records act when Eminem signed him in June of 2001. His first moment of public attention via Shady Records was when Obi Trice was featured on a freestyle skit on D12's Devil's Night album. Cheers benefited from having heavy hitters handling the production of every song, with Eminem and Dr. Dre involved in the bulk of the work, and Timbaland and D12's Mr. Porter showing up as well. As far as vocal features, Obi Trice also got Eminem showing up on four songs. The members of D12, Dr. Dre, Timbaland, 50 Cent, Busta Rhymes, Lloyd Banks, and Nate Dogg contributed twice. Even the two bonus tracks on Cheers were produced by DJ Muggs from Cypress Hill, who created the music for the song 8 Mile, and DJ Green Lantern, the renowned radio, mixtape, and club DJ, handled production on Synopsis. There were several verbal shots fired at Ja Rule, whom 50 Cent had a serious feud with at the time, proving that Obi Trice was all the way in with Shady and G-Unit. In 2006, Obi Trice bounced back with his second album, Second Rounds On Me, but it didn't have the same commercial impact as he experienced previously with Cheers, or the same lighthearted humor that mirrored the comedic sensibilities that attracted fans to Eminem and D12. The darker and grittier approach on Second Rounds On Me seemed to alienate Obi's audience, with his focus on street life tales with gloomier songs like Snitch and Violent, lacking the more colorful variety of production that he received from Dre and Timbaland on the Cheers album. Feeling that he wasn't being promoted properly, Obi Trice departed from Shady Records in June of 2008 while making it clear that he didn't have any ill will towards Eminem or Dre. In a statement related to Obi Trice's departure from Shady, Paul Rosenberg stated, Shady Records has agreed to allow Obi Trice to pursue his craft in a different form, free from the constraints of the current major label model. Eminem will continue to support and work with Obi on many levels of his career, he remains a close friend and member of the Shady family. Obi Trice did still collaborate with Eminem after leaving the label, which confirmed that there wasn't any bad blood between the two. Obi even owned up to some of the responsibility when it came to him leaving Shady Records during a 2012 interview with Hip Hop DX. The thing with Shady Records was it was an Interscope Records type situation. Me and Interscope Records chairman Jimmy Iovine were having issues back then. I was kind of reckless, not on time, certain things, and he didn't want to further the project with me. So we tried to work it out, but it just didn't come to a head. So I had to do what I had to do. Eminem, you know that's his boss, so he really didn't have any say-so in that. It was more of a Jimmy Iovine, Obi Trice type situation. That's still my family though, Shady Records. As you know, Eminem is on the album doing production and performance, so we still going to get this money together. Nothing changes that. And that's my brother forever. 
me and M forever close. It was more so just a big company and Jimmy. I miss the big boys neighborhood radio show. It'd be seven in the morning when I'm supposed to be there in LA and I got there. And the Interscope wreck took me out and we hung out and I kind of barricaded myself in a room. You know, I was young, fresh out the hood, jumped into this music thing. It was a little overwhelming for me. I didn't seize the moment when I should have, so I had to move on and that's just how things go. It's a business first and that's just how it was. Everything cool though, those are still my people over there at Interscope and Shady. That's family for life. By the time the hardcore Queens rapper 50 Cent was on Eminem's radar, 50 had already been mentored by the since deceased DJ of Run DMC, Jam Master J, made enemies out of Jay-Z, Ghostface Killer, and Fat Joe with his wildly disrespectful diss track How to Rob, survived being shot, lost a record deal with Columbia Records, and was essentially blackballed in the US music industry, to the point where he went to Canada to record music for his mixtapes. What was it about this brash rapper that made Eminem overlook all of this drama and see a future star worth investing in? It all started with one of those mixtapes from the early 2000s that 50 Cent recorded in Canada when New York City Studios refused to book his sessions due to his street reputation. 50 Cent explained how his music made it in front of Eminem, back when M was practically the biggest rapper on the planet. Theo, my attorney, and Paul Rosenberg work close together, like they know each other. They came up together, so I had a CD called Guess Who's Back, and M, right, got a copy of it, and he was in the middle of completing the Eminem show, so he didn't get a chance to properly listen to it. But after he got that done, he heard it, and he was like, y'all need to come out here now. So they flew me out on like Friday night. I fly to Los Angeles the next day, and I met with him and Dre, and then after we met, it was kinda all alright. 50 Cent's Guess Who's Back mixtape was a compilation of songs, many of which were recorded for Power of the Dollar, which was supposed to be his debut album for Columbia Records until he got shelved. Guess Who's Back was released in 2002 on an indie label, Full Clip Records, including guest appearances from Nas, Bum B, and Nature. After this independently released project made its way to Eminem, M fell in love with how believable 50 Cent's persona was when he rapped, and he was also impressed with 50 having his own crew, G-Unit, under his wing, which consisted of Lloyd Banks and Tony Yayo. 50 Cent signed a million dollar deal which was a joint venture between Eminem's Shady Records and Dre's Aftermath Entertainment, the first solo artist to do so. Not only was 50 Cent's debut album Get Rich or Die Tryin' the third album to come out on Shady Records and one of the most anticipated hip-hop albums of 2003, but it also moved an impressive 872,000 copies in its first week and became one of the few hip-hop albums to sell over 10 million copies in the United States. Controversy followed 50 Cent everywhere he went, whether it was the miracle of surviving the gunshots to surviving the wide range of rappers he openly dissed. 50 seemed like the ultimate troll before trolling was even a thing, even leading to Shady Records getting pulled into 50's feud with Ja Rule and the Irv Gotti-led label that Ja Rule was signed to Murder Inc. But 50 also had Eminem's back during Eminem's conflict with Boston rapper Benzino and the anti-Shady Records drama that spilled over into the Source magazine that Benzino was a co-owner of. 50 Cent's gigantic success announced to the world that Shady Records was capable of launching a star as big as Eminem himself. 50 Cent's second release, The Massacre, came out years later, and it showed that the value of 50 Cent's name was worth much more than half a dollar. The anticipated release of 50's follow-up album, The Massacre, set a record as the sixth fastest-selling album since Nielsen Soundscan started tracking albums in 1991, selling 1.14 million units in only four days. In fact, The Massacre was only 32,000 records away from becoming the best-selling album of 2005, which ended up being The Emancipation of Mimi by Mariah Carey. The excitement around 50 Cent was still high in comparison to the average major label rapper of that era, but when the sales numbers of his third album, Curtis, dropped down to 1 million from the previous 6 million copies he sold of The Massacre, it started to look like the general G-Unit was losing steam, especially when 50 Cent publicly claimed that he would quit putting out albums if Kanye West's third album, Graduation, outsold his upcoming third album, Curtis, which were both dropping on the same day. Not only did 50 Cent lose that sales battle, but he definitely didn't keep his word releasing another album two years later called Before I Self-Destruct, which sold even less. Before I Self-Destruct ended up being 50 Cent's first album not to go platinum, clinging to a decent gold plaque. This less impactful project also became the last album that 50 Cent would release on Shady Records and Aftermath. After 12 years signed to Interscope Records, Aftermath Entertainment, and Shady Records between 2002 to 2014, 50 Cent stepped away leaving the three companies with the ability to continue to be able to market and sell his first four albums. 
50 Cent and his G-Unit Records imprint signed an exclusive worldwide distribution and services agreement with Caroline Capital UMG. This deal was reported to be structured similarly to Cash Money's arrangement, in which Birdman's label Cash Money only had to give 7% of wholesale per album to Universal in return for distribution and support. In 2012, 50 Cent made it known that he was unhappy with his record label situation, but by the time 2014 rolled around, he expressed that there were no hard feelings against Eminem, Dre, or Jimmy Iovine. I've had great success to date with Shady Aftermath Interscope, and I'd like to thank Eminem and Dre for giving me an incredible opportunity. I've learned so much from them through the years, I'm excited to enter this new era where I can carry out my creative vision. Eminem clarified that he was on the same page with 50 by saying, I've developed a great friendship with 50 over the years, and that's not going to change. We know 50 will have success in his new situation, and we remain supporters of both him and G-Unit. In hindsight, you can make the argument that it may have been a good idea for Shady Records to separate from 50 Cent anyway because his biggest years appeared to be behind him, and they already owned 50 Cent's highest selling work. But the fact remains that 50 Cent was the biggest artist they ever had, and his departure was a sign that their rise as a company was likely going to start taking a dive. Not every artist signed to Shady Records made it to the studio album stage. There were a handful of hip-hop artists that got signed and only released mixtapes under Shady Banner, particularly DJ Green Lantern, Stat Quo, and Bobby Creekwater. DJ Green Lantern, the biggest DJ and producer out of Rochester, New York, went from his legendary mixtapes known for their creative interludes to becoming Eminem's tour DJ during the Anger Management Tour and signing to Shady Records in 2002. This led to three official Shady Records mixtapes from DJ Green Lantern. Invasion in 2002, Invasion Part 2, Conspiracy Theory in 2003, and Invasion Part 3, Countdown to Armageddon in 2004. But unfortunately, in 2005, an awkward situation pushed DJ Green Lantern and Shady Records to part ways. Piggy Bank, a song by Shady artist 50 Cent featuring 50, insulted several rappers including Jadakiss, causing a feud between the two. A few months later, with the beef between 50 and Jadakiss still buzzing, Jadakiss appeared on a street DVD and there was a segment where Jada had DJ Green Lantern on his phone's loudspeaker, but didn't inform Green Lantern that their conversation was being recorded for the DVD. Suddenly, the conversation began to sound like DJ Green Lantern was taking Jadakiss' side in the 50 Cent beef, making it seem from the outside looking in that his relationship with Jadakiss superseded his loyalty to Shady Records and their artist 50 Cent. When the DVD was released, Eminem found out and Green Lantern ended up leaving Shady Records, with his role as Eminem's DJ going to The Alchemist. DJ Green Lantern's radio show on Eminem's Shade 45 channel also came to an end, and what was to be DJ Green Lantern's upcoming album, Armageddon, was cancelled from the Shady Records release schedule. DJ Green Lantern spoke to MTV at the time in 2005 about what led to his split with Shady Records and said the following, I will admit to the fact that I was speaking to Jadakiss, somebody that was in a rap battle with 50 Cent. But at the same time, Jade is my dude. I've worked with him for years, so it wasn't anything for me to be talking with him. The inappropriate action on my part was when I'm commenting on his song telling him that's a jab, where's a knockout. That was some BS. It really looks like I wanted to take 50 Cent out. And there really isn't any feelings towards 50 Cent on my part, even though it looks like that if I'm Green Lantern from Shady Aftermath, and I shouldn't be commenting with Jadakiss on his song going at 50 Cent. At the same time, I'm also an individual that has a relationship with this guy. Choosing to put the conversation on the DVD created an unfortunate situation. We have conversations with other people on the phone where other people's names are mentioned that you still mess with, but you wouldn't want that to go to the world. I didn't want to create a tension between M and 50, with M going to bat for me and all that when it's a crazy situation. For what? I'll just be out. Eminem and Dre signed a joint deal with Atlanta rapper Stat Quo towards the end of 2003, making him the second artist to be signed to both Shady and Aftermath after Eminem and Dre heard Stat Quo's indie project, Underground Atlanta. But after signing his recording contract, appearing on several Shady-related songs, and putting out the mixtape The Prequel to Statlanta in 2006, meant to be a warm-up for his debut album Statlanta on Shady Records, a conflict in the studio between Stat and M led to Stat Quo getting dropped from Shady altogether. Stacko explained what he admits was a big mistake on his part. There was a song called Dance on it. M wrote the chorus and M wanted me to say the chorus. I thought it was not good. If I would have said, yeah, that's it, that's the one we going with, I would have got my album out. But I tried to be on some, nah, I don't like that, that ain't a hit. I was really arguing with the top selling rapper of all time on what a effing hit was. What a dummy idiot I was. My exact quote was, 
I'll put it out if you stay on the hook. And then I said, if you give me a million dollars, then I'll put it out. When I said that, me and M went like this, Stat said, miming two roads diverging with his hands. It was a wrap. Statco was told by Dre that Stat's studio pushback got Eminem upset. Even though Statco had tears in his eyes the next day when he attempted to apologize, it was too late to fix the broken bond. Eminem removed himself from Stat's project, Dr. Dre chose not to appear in Statco's music video for a song called Here We Go, and the parent company Interscope appeared to not be supportive of the single. By 2008, Statco was officially off of Shady Records, and Statlanta wouldn't see the light of day until seven years later on Big Dream Ventures Records. Another rapper from Atlanta that was eventually signed to Shady Records is Bobby Creekwater. Creekwater was recognized by Shady Records when label executives heard him rapping on a demo by an artist named Asim. But Eminem was only interested in Bobby Creekwater, and in mid-2005 signed him to Shady Records. Four years later, in 2009, while working on his debut album, A Brilliant Mistake, Bobby Creekwater asked to leave Shady Records. With no studio album getting released and two mixtapes, Anthem to the Streets and Anthem to the Streets 2, Creekwater explained his departure by saying, That particular relationship wasn't helping. As far as the plans I had for Bobby Creekwater, so we parted ways. I felt like it was time to move on, so I made a phone call to Shady, Paul Rosenberg. I said, I think it's time for me to go my way. He said he understood. Another artist that didn't get the studio album treatment from Shady Records is the Chicago-born, Orange County, California-based rapper named Cassius, who joined Shady Records in 2006 after his demo songs were heard by Eminem. He managed to release the 8-track The County Hound EP in May of 2007. There was also an announcement that Cassius would be putting out an official debut album on Shady Records called Loose Cannon that was to feature production from Eminem, Dr. Dre, The Alchemist, and Sean Money XL. Unfortunately, Cash's was forced to sit and wait as projected release dates in the fall of 2007 came and went with no album. Two years later in 2009, there was still no album as promised, with bigger Shady Records artist projects getting released instead. Finally, like many Shady Records artists before him, Cash's put in a request to be released from the label altogether, but that never got finalized until 2012, remaining contracted only as a songwriter. By the time Alabama rapper Yellow Wolf and the four-man crew Slaughterhouse, Royce the 5'9", Joe Budden, Crooked Eye, and Joel Ortiz, joined the label in the 2010s, they were being billed as part of Shady 2.0, the next phase of Eminem's company. On March 2, 2011, there was even a song called 2.0 Boys with Eminem, Slaughterhouse, and Yellow Wolf in a January 2011 XXL magazine cover that they all appeared on to promote this new generation of talent at Shady. Slaughterhouse first started as the name of a song on Joe Budden's album, Halfway House, that featured the other three rappers. One year later in 2009, Slaughterhouse was a group putting out their debut album on the indie label E1. After Eminem and Royce the 5'9 reunited after an extended hiatus, the two refueled their duo Bad Meets Evil with an EP on Shady Records and accepted an offer for Slaughterhouse to sign to Shady. Since signing in 2011, Slaughterhouse only released one album, Welcome to Our House in the late summer of 2012. It received mixed reviews and was criticized for sounding like they were forced to make commercial songs that were outside of their grittier dynamic. Welcome to Our House featured contributions from Eminem, Busta Rhymes, Swizz Beats, Hit Boy, No ID, Boy Wanda, and CeeLo Green, but it didn't do any remarkable sales numbers. In fact, they only moved 52,000 copies in their first week, back before streaming. Still, Slaughterhouse was a step in the right direction for the Shady Records brand, putting gifted rappers at the forefront and rebuilding Eminem's bond with Royce to 5'9". They started on a third album called Glass House, but it was never released. With Joe Budden having already made his transition into podcasting and being a journalist, he ended up making things worse for the group by openly criticizing Eminem's 2017 album Revival, while Slaughterhouse was still signed to Shady Records. Eminem addressed his confusion with Joe Budden's open critiques of M's 2017 album. But when I'm out here, flying around to different places and doing interviews and trying to use my platform to pump up Slaughterhouse every chance I get, and you're using your platform to try to trash me? On April 26, 2018, Royce the 5'9 announced that Slaughterhouse had officially disbanded. To show off the brand new roster of talent that Eminem signed to Shady Records in 2011, Eminem, along with Yellow Wolf, freestyled over East Flatbush's project, Tried by 12 on a BET Cypher segment at the 2011 BET Hip Hop Awards that was hosted by DJ Premier, which was referred to as the Shady 2.0 BET Cypher. But in 2012, roughly a year after signing with Shady Records, Yellow Wolf expressed in an interview that there may have been some trouble in paradise behind the scenes. 
I don't know what the F they're doing up there. Shady's great. I love Shady Records. Man, I just think there's some stuff going on upstairs, but I don't know what the F is going on. Back to trunk music. When you consider the two mixtapes Yellow Wolf released in 2013 on Shady Records along with his four album releases, Radioactive in 2011, Love Story in 2015, Trial by Fire in 2017, and Trunk Music 3 in 2019, Yellow Wolf put out more projects on Shady than any of the label's other signees. This clear recognition that Eminem was invested in his flourishing career didn't prove to be enough to stop Yellow Wolf from parting ways with Shady Records in 2019 and going independent with the release of his 2019 album Ghetto Cowboy. It's unclear if a beef that Eminem's friend Royce the 59 later had with Yellow Wolf had any impact on his separation from Shady Records. DJ Vlad from Vlad TV came out in January of 2020 with the behind the scenes take on the Yellow Wolf vs. Royce the 59 beef, which he claimed was racially motivated. I have permission to talk about it. This is what I heard. This is a Vlad TV exclusive. Apparently, Royce sent one of his protégés to work with Yellow Wolf. I guess out in Alabama. Yellow Wolf had a white DJ, and the kid who went out there was black. And Yellow Wolf had a white DJ and he started using the N-word around this guy. When the guy went and complained to Yellow Wolf, Yellow Wolf said you just need to take it. And if you want to work with us, you're going to need to basically tolerate us using the N-word with the hard R. And during the conversation, Yellow Wolf was using the N-word with the hard R. And when the information got back to Royce, that triggered the dissing. Apparently, it took Royce openly dissing Yellow Wolf on the 2020 song Overcomer to get Yellow Wolf's attention and to squash their conflict behind the scenes after Royce rapped lines like, Yellow Wolf, this is your first and your last pass. I ain't gonna put it on blast. Your punk ass know what this about. You think it's about being loud or trying to be hostile till you get found face down on the ground outside a Kid Rock house. Though you a vulture pundit, I hope you get sober from this. For many years during the 2010s, the Buffalo, New York independent label Griselda Records, consisting of the rappers West Side Gun, Conway the Machine, and Benny the Butcher, were making grimy, lyrical East Coast hip-hop popular again. The Griselda crew was getting co-signed by many of the 90s rap legends that they were inspired by like Mob Deep, Wu-Tang, and The Locks. On March 3rd, 2017, Shady Records and Griselda Records made it known that Shady had signed West Side Gun and Conway to the label both individually and collectively as Griselda. It seemed like Eminem had found his new version of Slaughterhouse, another non-pop-oriented rap group that had serious credibility and built-in fan bases as well. But fans were confused when Griselda as a group and Westside and Conway each only put out one album on Shady and were gone. Speaking on the Joe Budden podcast, ironically, Joe Budden being someone who used to be signed to Shady with Slaughterhouse, the Griselda Records founder Westside Gun clarified that his affiliation with Shady ended after the release of Who Made the Sunshine, stating, Um, I'm off Shady. I'm actually a free agent. It feels great. Who Made the Sunshine was it? I already spoke to Paul. Everything's good. Like everything's signed, sealed, and delivered. I have my paperwork, like I'm off Shady. I'm one of those type of dudes. I'm not no public talking dude. That's just how I move. It's like saying me and Benny or me and Conway or Conway and Benny or whoever, we might have a disagreement, but the world will never know. We still gonna be brothers and cousins. It's the same way even with business because at the end of the day, this is a big world. Even if somebody else is a sucker, I'm never gonna play that sucker role. It had been reported that Westside Gunn had spoken out about his disappointment with Shady Records as it pertained to what Westside felt was a lack of promotion, and Eminem not even bothering to plug his album on social media. Westside even tweeted, I wonder do at Shady Records know we're nominated for a BET award tonight? With Shady Records past heavyweights like D12, 50 Cent, OB Trice, and the like, all having left to lead their own journeys, the only current talent left on the label besides Eminem himself and his duo Bad Meets Evil with Royce the 59 that has been quiet since 2011 was Westside Boogie from Compton and Grip from Atlanta. Even with critical acclaim, none of their projects on Shady managed to put up the sales numbers that other, more popular Shady Records alumni have been able to achieve. Eminem explained the approach that Shady Records takes to signing new talent on the label. Obviously, we want anyone who signs with Shady to succeed. But first and foremost, we've always focused on the raw talent and ability of the artist as an MC. We've always been pretty clear on that being the main thing we look for. High-level fundamental skills and mechanics are definitely the priority. It's really important in creative collaboration for there to be that personal connection for it to succeed. Shady is a boutique label, and we don't sign a lot of artists, so we have a chance to get involved at a deeper level with the ones we do. And I think that goes both ways. I like to be motivated by the artists we sign, and I want to feel pushed by their creativity as well. The people we sign have a point of view and vibe that made us want to work with them in the first place. 
part of our job is to help them get out to a bigger audience, but also I don't like to insert myself where I'm not needed. I'm looking to find where and how I can get involved that adds to or builds on what the artist is already doing. Unfortunately, since his 2021 debut album, Grip, has since left Shady Records and Aftermath, and the only person that's still on there that released a project in 2022 was Westside Boogie. So what does the future of the company even look like? It's clear that Eminem is putting a high premium on lyrical skill as a trademark for the rappers that he goes into business with, and after the Griselda camp parted ways with Shady, as well as Grip who had an excellent debut project, who could be the next bar-heavy hip-hop artist to get the Eminem cosign that only Shady Records can provide and not only sustain a career, but manage to stay on Shady Records and reach a level of mainstream popularity? Make sure to subscribe for more.